What's up, friends? Hello. Welcome back to another episode of the New Evangelicals Podcast. It is great to be here with you. On this episode of the show, I have John Steingart, who is the former frontman for the band Hawk Nelson. Now, for those of us who grew up in the Christian music scene, Hawk Nelson was a staple, at least for me anyway, and I saw them several times. Well, Hawk Nelson continued their career all the way from like the more underground punk stuff and, and, and punk rock stuff all the way through to Caleb, and John was one of the frontmen for the band. John left the band, I think about a year or two ago now, after it turned out he deconstructed and really lost his evangelical faith. So John came on the show. We had a really good discussion about what it's like being in a Christian band, what it's like going through that process, what were some of the elements that caused him to deconstruct. And John had a lot of insight and a very unique uh, perspective because he's really seen the Christian music industry. He's seen sides of it that, that a lot of us have not seen before. So I was super happy to have John on and I hope you really enjoy this interview. That being said, I want to say again, thank you to all of our supporters. As always, if you can give this episode a review and a rating, if you're listening to it on podcast or a like and subscribe, if you're watching it on YouTube, that would be just a humongous help. It really helps us get the word out there. And I really do my best to find people that I think are unique, that will hopefully give unique perspectives to what so many of us are going through. And of course, a huge shout out to everyone who has so graciously donated uh, to help make this all happen. So we don't have paywalls. We don't run ads. We believe in the generosity of people who give whatever they have to allow us to make this happen. So people volunteer for graphic design, people volunteer for website design, and some people donate financially to make it happen. So I have links in the show notes if you want to get involved or donate. And again, a huge thank you. One more thing I haven't told you guys in a while. We do have merch, by the way. So there's a link in the show notes for that as well. If you want to get some merch and pick up a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, that would be so helpful. All right, friends, enough of me. Uh, uh, and now you're going to watch me in the past interview John Steingart. Hope you enjoy it. All right, John, um, listen, I appreciate you making time, um, you know, out of your busy schedule. Um, so thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Dude, thank you so much for having me, Tim. I'm stoked to be here with you. Absolutely. You know, I was telling you before we started recording, just for fun, I'm like, you know, Hawk Nelson, I have not heard that name in so long. So I threw on some old tracks. I threw on the song California, which for me, I, I kind of grew up in that, like, in that world of music. It was you guys, Stellar Cart was a big band I listened to. Oh, yeah. You, if you remember yeah. them, um, you know, and then all kinds, of, even some smaller bands like Falling Up, The Wedding, uh, Under Oath, of course, Emery. So yep. it was kind of cool to have that little moment of like, oh, It's a man. lot of our uh, label mates in that list yes, right there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So yep. you were in the band Hawk Nelson. I mean, that's right. Mm -hmm. How long were you there for? How many years? 50, 15, 16 years, something like that. Yeah. Man. So I gotta, all right, I'm gonna be fully transparent. I'm a little jealous because you, you got, you got a chance to live at least my perceived <laughs> dream. All right. As a drummer, who I got to, to make it big, you know? Right. I got to live my own perceived dream and uh, perceived is the operative word there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. What was that like for you? I mean, you know, you, I'm assuming you started playing music and you, you, you did it. You, you got the dream. You were touring, doing all the good stuff. What was that like for you at, at that time? Yeah. It, so, I mean, it's simultaneously, it is exactly what you hope it is. And also nothing like that at all. Like, um, I know that's such a not satisfying, uh, uh, answer but in in some ways it really is living the dream right like what like so i joined i joined hawk nelson as the guitar player right when the first record was coming out so i wasn't a part of making the first record which was called letters to the president right i wasn't a part of making that record but right around the same time that that album was coming out uh the the original guitar player dave um he had just gotten married and and there was some like everyone was very young they were trying to figure out like hey does this we're touring in a van situation is that working with a brand new marriage so there was right, a lot of that right. and it just wasn't really working for anybody and so so dave went home and they, and i had known the guys for quite some time so they asked me to come and join as the guitar player so i joined in 2004 and uh you know, for the first three or four years, we were playing like 250 shows a year. Wow. Um, we basically lived out of that van for a few years. I didn't have a fixed address. I mean, from 2004, when I joined until 2007, when I got married, I did not have a fixed address for those years. Wow. Um, and it was, if you're wired like me, which I th think you might be, um, 
that was a blast. And yeah, in that yeah. in that season of my life, yes. I wouldn't have changed a thing, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. we weren't making money, like we were dirt poor. Really? Uh, oh gosh, yeah. Oh my gosh, those early years, yeah, there was the perception of money usually precedes actual money. <laughs> uh, okay, good to <laughs> I mean, know. I mean it depends, right? It's like it yeah. depends. So like there's a number of different aspects to this but our singer at the time uh jason he was a type one diabetic and so um he he once we started touring he had a, a hard time regulating his insulin levels mm -hmm. um and his health became a pretty constant concern for us and so very early on we were like okay we actually need to to have some sort of stability in our lives um because he like he literally physically medically might not survive this lifestyle right so we got into touring in a tour bus instead of a van and we did that before really it would have been a smart financial move for okay. us to do it gotcha. so we, we did it early because we were concerned about his health yeah um and it was the right call um but it just meant we were touring in a tour bus earlier than we probably should have been okay and and so we'd roll up to a show right and and then people that we had seen when we were touring in a van would be like oh i see you you know hawk right. nelson you're just rolling deep now right yeah, you guys are right. making those fat stacks and i'm always like no 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 we we might be making slightly fatter stacks if we didn't have the tour bus right but we have the tour bus instead of fat stuff yeah. okay i got you <laughs> so it was kind of like that like it's like was there money flying around yes but like did it end up in our personal bank accounts almost never mm. no that's it was kind of like that yeah okay. um but every band sort of parses that stuff differently yeah yeah i think it's just hard for me to know because like you know you see these bands you, you see you you go to i go to the venue i see these bands that are on tour you just automatically assume that like there's real money happening and obviously as i got older sometimes there is yeah in but the industry it was like it's more hit or miss you know so yeah it, it has a lot to do with the emphasis like i remember bands at our same level that were still touring in a van but like all the members were married and had families and I, and, and owned houses. And I remember being like a guy in a band owning a house. Like, like that seemed so knowing what was in my bank account, that right. seemed so distant, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we were on a tour bus and they weren't. So it's right. like, it just depends on what you look at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, so you're with Hawk Nelson you guys had, a, I mean, I haven't, honestly, I haven't, I haven't really followed, your band history but i know that at some point there's there was a well maybe it wasn't a point but was there an evolution of like a sonic change as well for sure i mean obviously yeah. what, what i heard on california is not what was playing in 2018 or 20 whatever it was 27 that's right so what yep. was the evolution like for you as a songwriter and as a musician was that intentional or just kind of like where you were at you know at the time how did that go sure yeah there's layers to that so so i when i joined i was the guitar player Okay. So I was the guitar player for eight years from 2004 until about 2012. Mm. And during that time, my role in the band was pretty supportive. Like um, I wasn't one of the main songwriters. Jason, our, our lead singer, was probably like the persona of the band, I guess. Okay. So like yeah. in the very pop punk years, he was it was very Jason oriented. Sure. And he he was a great front man. Uh, and so it was a, a real joy for me in a lot of ways to support like a, um, a confident and uh, charismatic front man, sure. you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and I didn't really have any desire to be a front man. I, I enjoyed my role uh, as the guitar player and, and a sort of supportive role. Well, then Jason left the band in late 2011, early 2012. Right. And initially we were like, well, I guess that's it. We've had a good run. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, but we were encouraged to consider reformulating the band, okay. um, with, with sort of a different approach by some friends of, of ours that were in other bands. Okay. And the idea was floated that I should become the new singer. Mm. Um, and initially I was resistant to that idea because my thought was, like I can be the guitar player in a pop punk band, but I don't think I can be the singer in a pop punk band. It's just not me. It wouldn't be authentic. I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't do the old songs like justice. It's right, not my, right. 
I could be the guitar player in that band, but I don't think I could be the <laughs> singer in that band. Sure. sure. And, and the response to that from some of the people that we were close to was like, well, what if you just give yourself permission to evolve and take the DNA of who you are and what you've built and, and make something new with it. And when, when I heard that, I was like, well, that's interesting. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, me and Daniel and Justin, who were the, the bass player and drummer in the guitar in, in the, in the band at the time, uh, the three of us talked about it and we were like, that actually does sound like a kind of an adventure that we'd be interested in. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And so in 2012, I became the singer of the band. Um, and I also became the main songwriter and we embraced the idea that I was not a pop punk guy. Hmm. And, and so, and so we sort of just went full on to this sort of more pop rock space with a lot less of a punk influence. Right. Because that's just where I was at more musically. And that's what my voice lended itself to a little bit more. And so that, that had a lot to do with the sort of stylistic change. Okay. But simultaneously, mm. there had been a shift in Christian culture that I had noticed. Yes. Going from a place of like, hey, we want Christian versions of general market bands. Right. And so like our early Hawk Nelson albums are very much like, if I were to tell you, Oh, it was basically like a Christian version of Good Charlotte or Blink-182. Right, right. You would listen to those early albums and go like, oh, yeah, I, I see that. Totally. You know, um, but toward the time when Jason left the band and I became the singer, that really wasn't the state of Christian music anymore. Yeah, I agree. It was much more like if if you were going to be sort of just vaguely positive and not explicitly Christian, then you should probably just go and do a general market thing like a switchfoot or a yeah. colony house or, yeah. Yeah. you know, need to breathe or yeah. something like that. Totally. Um, which I actually thought was a healthy evolution, you know? Um, right. But it was like, if you're going to participate in Christian music, like as actual Christian music, you, you need to bring something to the table that, really incorporates your faith more overtly. Mm. Um, and I was noticing that shift. And, and so I, I thought that since we're making a break musically, we should also make a break thematically and we should speak about faith related matters more directly. That, mm -hmm. that was something I felt. Uh, and so, so that was another layer to the, the change. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, you know, that, that's, it's always different hearing the story versus like what you think, right? Cause yeah. you know, I'm sure you have all these people, fans who are like, Oh, they sold out. They want mainstream. I mean, that's such a common thing. I, and I feel like bands like that bands can't win. Either you evolve into who you are and yeah. it's different than who you were. It's, it's a sellout or you stay sure. the same and you just suck, right? Like, Oh, they never adapted and evolved. Like there's no, in between. I, it seems yeah. Like for me. I mean, we had some people that were like, Oh, you guys have, you know, you guys have changed in like a negative way or something <laughs> right. like that. Like, oh, I, I liked you better when you were pop punk. And and right. to that, I just want to be like, well, no, you liked us during that time yeah. Yeah. being pop punk. Right. Like us in 2016 being pop punk right. is not the same thing as us in 20, in 2006 being pop punk. It's just totally. not the same thing. And so- I, I always took that stuff with a grain of salt and, and I would always say, look like no one's coming to your house, taking your like old Hawk Nelson CDs away. Like you can still <laughs> listen to them, you know? Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know. I never really took that stuff super personally. I developed That's a good. pretty thick skin and um, the first two albums that we released with me as the singer, I still to this day have not read any reviews of them. Really? Um, actually, no, sorry. The first one, the first album I still to this day, I think the second one I started to get a little confident and I was like, you know, I bet people don't hate this entirely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, you obviously had a, had a successful career in that space. So, you know, you were obviously well received, I believe, you know, overall. And even stuff I heard, I, I liked, you know. Yeah, it was interesting. Like, well that, stuff. like I, I do think there was a second arc. Like it was like two arcs of Hawk Nelson and, yeah. and I appreciate them both. Uh, for what they were yeah and they were both times of my life that i think positively about and sure. fondly of and sure. um 
And even, even, you know, after going through a pretty significant shift in the way I see uh, Christianity and faith and God, right. which we can talk about, um, I, I still look back at those times in my life and I'm just like, what a great mm. experience yeah. I got to have. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for, for me, the most positive aspects of it actually have nothing to do with music. Hmm. Um, for, for me, it's entirely like the, the people I got to meet, hmm. the, uh, the guys I got to be in a band with, because that's like, that's more like siblings than anything else. Hmm. You know, you spend yeah. so much time together, you, you spend enough time together that you, you begin to like really be irritated with each other yes. in the way yeah. that siblings are. But then it's like, if someone comes at your, your sibling, you're like, Oh hell no. Like, right. no, right. that's my boy. You right. know? Right. Um, so it's like totally. that whole dynamic I'm really grateful for. And then, and then, you know, I've gotten to travel a lot. I've been yeah. to every state in 36 countries and wow. um, not all of that was with music. I've, I, I do film work now that I've gotten to travel wow. a lot with. Um, but, you know, overall, just a really good experience. So let's kind of, you know, talk a little bit about obviously this big shift that you had. I think you came out in May of 2020, right? Like yeah. Publicly. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially saying that you don't believe in God anymore. So obviously that, and well, that, that moment that, that you stand publicly, obviously I'm sure had a lot of thoughts and layers leading up yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're in this Christian band, you're in this Christian world, you're the front man, you, you know, at shows, I'm sure you have to say something about God or something Yeah. In, mm -hmm. in the back of your mind, like what started this, you know, for the sake of our conversation we'll call it the 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 deconstruction you know what yeah. started you really deconstructing i've gotten uh, a lot more comfortable with that word i know we all dance around it and we wish for a better word but this yeah. is the one we have and it just so, is what it is you know yeah it's it's the one we have and and i'm I, i'm really coming to peace with it so yes deconstruction yeah um yeah so you know i've thought a lot about this and every time i get asked about it depending on the day i feel like i answer it a little bit differently because sure. my as I continue to reflect on it, um, it right. keeps sort of revealing more layers to me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in the context of our conversation so far, as I think about it, mm. I, I realized that one of the things that motivated me above all else in my time in the band is that I loved participating in, uh, in people experiencing goodness and freedom and, and, uh, um, Ah, uh, community and connection and um, participating in the stories of people leaving, leaving places that were not good for them and going to places that were better for them. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in Christian music, that very often took the form of people who had had very difficult pasts and were, were sort of finding God in, in some way or finding like a Christian community that was really helpful and meaningful to them. Yeah. Um, as time went on, I began to have a lot of questions about Christianity and Christian culture. Honestly, it was Christian culture that started my questions Okay. because I started to see things that I'm just like, that seems weird or kind of unhealthy or like not great. Um, and then that led me to start of sort of investigate the core claims of Christianity more than I ever had. So there was an experiential element and then an intellectual element. But but throughout the whole thing, my what I care about never changed. Mm, like mm -hmm. so I have a podcast and a YouTube show now called The Wonder and the Mystery of Being. And I'm investigating this gray area in between belief and unbelief. And right. So I, I don't consider myself an internet atheist, although <laughs> depending on the day, uh -huh. a, atheist could technically be accurate as far as my, you know, my views, depending on how you define atheist and how you define God and all totally, this stuff. Totally, totally. So, but, but at the same time, I, I, I don't call myself a Christian because I don't, I don't feel like spending energy to get into the the arguments of like v validating my usage of the term for myself. So I just mm. don't use it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. So, so yeah, I, I don't call myself an atheist or a Christian. I'm just a human being who's really curious about people and uh, the human race and about existence and about religion and spirituality. 
And I like, I just love all that stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, my mission is still to see people walk into healthier ways of being, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And like, um, if that means leaving a faith tradition, then yeah, I'm going to be in your corner as you do that. You know, right. if, if that means modifying your, your sort of views, still calling yourself a Christian, like I'm in your corner too. You know, I'm just like, I, I, I want to see people experience goodness and wholeness and grace and, um, and a healthy, meaningful life. And every time I get to participate in someone's life becoming more like that, it just, it, it absolutely br brings me life. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, my, my emphasis and what I care about has never changed. Hmm. What are some of those things in Christian culture for you that, that started to make you go, huh, that's sure. strange. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, an early one for me was, uh, the LGBTQ plus yeah. issue. Yeah. So, uh, I remember when the Supreme court legalized same sex marriage, I was still very active in Hawk Nelson at the time. And I remember being like, like immediately I was like, my gut was like, Oh, that's a good thing. This is good. Mm -hmm. And at that time I had a few friends that were gay, but not like a ton. Right. And I remember being like, there was this one couple I knew that had been together for a really long time. And they, uh, they were in a committed same sex relationship and they had wanted to get married for ages. And I knew immediately, as soon as I heard this ruling, I knew I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to get to get married. Right. They've wanted this for so long. And I was like immediately celebrating it with them. Right. Right. Uh, in my, in my heart. And I was like, oh, but I can't say that publicly Yeah, yeah. because I would lose, I would lose my career, you know? Um, so that was something that I was like, wow, my heart is really taking me in this direction, but my, the culture I'm embedded in is, is, is taking me in another direction. Yeah. So, so that was sort of an early one for me. And that that's only grown. And, and, um, as I've, you know, become more openly affirming of the LGBTQ plus yep. community yep. and indeed, I, I I actually would consider myself an advocate for that community or an ally, you know, like I really deeply care about speaking about issues of gay and trans individuals. And as someone who's a white cis hetero uh -huh. man, right. I occupy a position of privilege. Yeah. So if I can use my voice to, to advocate for some of these people that don't have some of those benefits, I want to do that. And it's a joy for me to do that. So that, that was one issue. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, there was a, a number of sort of doctrinal things. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a, a documentary in Uganda okay. about, a uh, uh, an indigenous people group there. And I saw suffering on a scale that I had really never experienced before. And mm -hmm. so the whole idea of a God who intervenes on behalf of humanity became challenging for me. And so mm -hmm. it, intellectually we call this the problem of evil or the problem of suffering right right but i like i i sort of backed into the intellectual conversation through a very spiritual door or sorry not spiritual but experiential like, door right a human door yeah like i you know i was documenting this people group where most children don't make it to the age of five wow and and i had just become a father myself Oof. and so and so I was there watching these kids. Like I had this moment where I watched, I watched a four-year-old as the sun went down and it kind of got cool in the evening. I watched a four-year-old take their sweater off and put it on a two-year-old. And in that moment, I realized, oh, this four-year-old is parenting this two-year-old hmm. because that's all, this is the only person this two-year-old has. Right. And like, I like, I actually, I have to work to not like weep when I tell this because it's like, I saw stuff like this yeah. and I was like, and, th and like, that's one of the tamer stories I would have from this right. experience. And I was like, I don't know what to do with the idea of an all powerful, all loving God. Yeah. And then the experience that I'm having right now, like, I don't know how to hold both of these things. Um, 
So that was a really big issue for me. And then of course you come back to America and you're like, you hear people being like, oh, you know, the, the Lord just blessed me so much this morning. Uh -huh. I, I was a little late to, to church and I didn't think I was going to get a parking spot. And I prayed and there was just, and then God just delivered me this parking spot. And he, yeah. you know, he loves me so much that he answers even my tiny little insignificant prayers. Right. And, and I hear that stuff and like, I don't want to mock anybody. I don't want to mock anyone's experience, but I right. hear that stuff. And I'm just like, God, if you're answering those prayers because you love this person this much, there's some there's some questions I have for you about these people over here. <laughs> totally. You know, and so stuff like that was a really big deal for me too. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm a I have an 11 month old. I'm a I'm a newer father too. Oh, like, congratulations! Thank you. And it you changes know, everything. Changes. Yeah. I mean. Man, my wife and I now, if we watch like these like murder documentaries, if kids are involved, I'm like, turn oh, it off. I can't do it. I cannot I can't do, do it. it. Don't want to do it. Like it just, I used to be so you. hard. Say, yeah, dude, same. My I'm empathy so, was so low. <laughs> I'm so soft now. I can't, I can't um, handle it. It changes it, man. So I get that. And I also understand the LGBTQ issue as well. I mean, that's been a huge pain point or it was a huge pain point not anymore i'm pretty much affirming now but you know right go, going through this journey of like growing up in this evangelical spaces that really ended up dehumanizing the lgbt yeah. people and then hearing my friends stories about people who call themselves christians who just treated them like garbage i mean th those experiences they do change you you're, you're so on the money because they they make you they make you take your head th theology and they put it in, they put a human in front of you yeah. And essentially, it says, wait, these don't line up like the humanity yep. of this person is worth less to some Christians than their headspace. Something isn't is, isn't right there. So so you're in Hawk Nelson thinking about these things at this time. Now, do your bandmates know this? Or are you are you able to talk to them about this? Yeah, we were talking about it um, separately. I had because I had. I, so I mentioned I had just become a father. I was doing right. film work on the side. I was still okay. doing Hawk Nelson. OK. Um, and at this point. I realized I had this realization that like I would probably be able to make a career of doing film work if I wanted to. Oh, and, and, and I was like, okay, I've done music for 15 years. Would I, would I rather do film work? And there's also an added element of like the music, the music career thing required that I tour. Right. And so I was gone for 15 years. I was gone all like a lot. Right. And when I say gone, I mean like not home, wherever home happened to be. Right. And, and once I became a dad, I was like, I don't want to be gone this much. Yeah. And if there's another career I could do that would pay our bills and it would allow me to be home more, like I should probably consider that. Right. And then also I was noticing at that same time, like our career had sort of like settled into this very comfortable place where like, you know, we were making a, an, a, a decent living. It was like enough to live off, but it was, you know, no one was getting rich, but it was, it was like, we were fairly comfortable, you know, like the rare case of a middle-class musician. Right. <laughs> right. Seriously. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't tend to happen, but that's where right. we were. Wow. You and, did it. And uh, which is like, to me, that's just like grand success is if you can get to middle-class as a musician. Totally. Um, so I, but it occurred to me, I'm like, we're doing the same festivals every year. We're doing the same events every mm -hmm. year. There's like two major tours that everyone tries to get on winter jam and roadshow. <laughs> yeah. The whole game is trying to get on those two. Right. And then like in the fall, hoping that like you can tour with Jeremy camp or mercy me, right. both of which we did, you know, it's like, and then like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, we were just following into this rhythm and I'm like, I could see myself just getting comfortable and doing this for a long time and never questioning why, hmm. or, or I could clear the board. I could go do film work, which I have no idea what that's going to look like. Hmm. And I could, I could build into that, like an ability to be home with my family. Right. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. That second option. And so I talked to the guys and I was like, Hey, I'm not freaking out. I'm not quitting, but I do need to, I need an exit ramp. That's sort of how I okay. told them. Right. I was like, somewhere on this journey in the next few years, I need a, a way out. Um, right. and it was a difficult conversation, but ultimately we agreed on, we would, we would basically continue for, uh, for two more years. 
and and so I gave my two years notice. <laughs> two years. Uh, yeah. So you. <laughs> um, so so that was the plan. So but then the beginnings of my sort of deconstruction process. Yeah. Happened during that two years oh, because okay. I knew where I was okay. headed, and the more that I was doing film work, the more I realized like my clients don't care what I believe. You know, some of them are right. Christian, but but a lot of them aren't. You know, right. if I I, I have some some clients. I, I I found myself doing some work for some big tech companies, which was okay. super cool. That's cool. Um, like I, they're all under NDA, so I can't say who they are, but they're na- they're companies you know. Um, <laughs> and and they don't like they didn't care if I was Christian or right. not or what my beliefs were. It didn't matter. And right. so I had the thought, what do I believe if if I don't need to believe anything yes. in particular for a mm-hmm. career, right. like? If my career doesn't necessitate a set of beliefs, right. what do I believe? Right. And that question, uh, it simultaneously excited me and terrified me. Yeah, totally. Um, and and that question sort of led me on this journey that has brought me to where I am today. Um, did you grow up in the church your whole life? Oh yeah. Pastor's, pastor's kid. kid right? Yeah. Yeah. Pastor's kid. Very charismatic evangelical. Oh, okay. Um, grew up in the vineyard. In fact, yeah, grew up, uh, in, in churches that were dismissed from the vineyard when things got too crazy. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so wow. it's, a, it was a little, a little out there. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I asked because you mentioned how, you know, for me, it was very anxiety inducing. Right. And I think it's because when you grow up in these spaces, you don't realize how much of your identity is attached to your religious belief. And the thought of losing that for me felt like part of losing me almost, you know, yeah, well, who, yeah. who am I really? Oh yeah. I don't hold well, these same beliefs. Well, and that's not by accident either. Like how many times were you and I both told like your identity is in Christ. Oh right? my God. So, so which like that idea sounds good. Yes. Like, it sounds good, but like when you step back and now it's like, well, hold on. Are we teaching people to, are we, I mean, this whole, like he must increase, I must decrease thing. Yes. 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 I, I get where that's coming from. And yes. there's an, there's an element of it that is, uh, that is, that is well-meaning, right? Like I, I get that, uh, but the effect that it sometimes had was to teach people that they had to make themselves as small as possible exactly. and they had to think as little of themselves as possible. Yep. And there's elements of that that are really, really unhealthy Yes. and damaging and traumatic. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and so I, I don't say any of that to attack anybody because yep. if you, you know, you say it like that and, and, almost any evangelical I know would be like, Oh yeah, that's not how it's meant to be. And I'm right. like, great, cool. Awesome. That's how a lot of people received it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And it um, caused a lot of trauma. I mean, there's, yeah. there's just no way. I mean, there's a reason why John we've seen this explosion of this term deconstruction. There's a yeah. reason why your account has blown up Why my account has grown recently as well, because there are people who grew up in these spaces who are like, it's not that I was for most people, I was intentionally like harmed. I don't think my pastor was trying to hurt me, but they yeah. did. Like the theology I learned for me, especially gave me this, this self doubt. Like you said, yeah. okay, to live as Christ, to die as gain. I have died to myself. You know, you can't trust your heart. It's deceitfully wicked above all things. How, yeah. what do you do with that at, at, at age 13? Besides just not learn how to trust yourself or your intuition. Yeah. And I know, I mean, uh, you know, I've interviewed people and, and talked, to so, I mean, over the last year, I've spoken to thousands of people who have wow. gone through this process, yeah. and 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 there's some themes, and that's one of them. Is that is this this sense of like I was taught not to trust myself, yep. not to trust my feelings, not to trust my desires, not to trust my body, yeah. not to trust uh, my instincts, yep. and 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 to deny all of those things and instead replace it with the perspective biblical interpretation and theology of whoever, uh, I was leading me. You're exactly right. You're on and, the- and, um, I, I have a friend who's a progressive Christian who, who he loves to say it's discernment all the way down is how, <laughs> uh, so this is Dan Koch who has a, a podcast oh, called, I love uh, Dan stuff. Yeah. I love, yes, I love Dan. So, so Dan says, cause, cause I sort of posed to him the question that a lot of sort of mainstream evangelicals would pose to progressive Christians. It's like, well, if you unmoor yourself 
from biblical inerrancy and like some of these Christian traditions, like what do you base your beliefs on? And Dan's response to that often is, well, it's discernment all the way down. Mm, um, and, but as that relates to what you were talking about, it's like, if you teach people that they can't discern, right, then that's not going to work for them. And so like, and I do think a, a, a whole generation, I'll, I'll speak, I mean, I'm 37. So I'll speak for people roughly my age, although this process is not strictly speaking yes. people my age, but it right. seems to have a, a hot spot, yep. you know? Yep. Um, a lot of the people my age, it's like they never learned to, to discern or they're learning to discern now, Exactly. you know, exactly. Or, or like they were, they were trained n- not to discern. Yep. Yep. Well and, said. and I think that was problematic and now they're discerning, right? Exactly. And so now they're going like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, yes, this is sort of messed up. Some of this stuff that you've been telling me for all these years. Right. No, you're, yeah. you're, you're, Everything you just said is so spot on. I'm 32. We're in the roughly the same age range, and yep. right, it's a hot spot. Um, was there something like was there was there like a for you? Was it a okay? This is the moment where I realized I just don't believe this anymore, or was it like a slow progression? But it was a progression, like a progression. So there wasn't oh, just yeah. like one belief for you that like no. Did. Almost everybody I talk to says it's a progression for them too. It was for me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like. And, and that's one of the reasons that people land in different places. Cause I think there's a range of, yeah. of mm-hmm. the, there's a number of different steps you can go through yeah. and some people go through a few of them and then stop. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that like they're lesser than the people that continue. I just mean that like they get to a place where they're like, this works for me right here, yeah. you know, and then other people continue. So, so I would say a lot of my friends that have ended up being progressive Christians, like they've deconstructed the biblical inerrancy thing, the same thing, same way that I have. And they're like, okay, well, I don't believe that anymore. Right. And then maybe they've deconstructed the belief in hell thing. And they're like, yep. okay, well, I don't believe in hell anymore. That's whew, it's nice. That's off the table. Yep. Um, but, but they sort of like still believe in God as a being or as a person sometimes, you know, right. and like, right. That's something that I, at the moment, you know, sure. we know these things are in flux at of the course. moment. That's not a view that I hold. Um, yep. So, so I've sort of gone a little further along that line. And then, and then some people go all the way to straight up reductive physicalism or materialism or naturalism. So it's like only those things that you can taste and touch and see and smell only that is real. And I don't believe in anything outside of that. Right. And I I sort of went all the way there. And then I took a few steps back because, (laughs) because there's a few things that, are not uh, strictly speaking material that mm-hmm. I think are pretty undeniably real. Um, the most basic one being information. Mm. Um, so Daniel Dennett, uh, who's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, yep. if you're yep. if you follow them, uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. So so he talks a lot about materialism plus information, and I find that when you add information, all of a sudden things start to get really interesting. Mm. Um, and then I also studied phenomenology a little bit. So it's a, it's a field of study that's somewhere in between psychology and philosophy. Okay. And it's basically the, the study of human experience hmm. and human experience. It's like the study of subjective human experience. So the most famous phenomenologist is Martin Heidegger. Okay. And he sort of posited this thing. He's like, He's like, well, science is great and it's helped us a lot, right? Right, right. But the whole way that we do science is by stripping subjectivity out of our, we strip out as much subjectivity as we can to get to the quote unquote objective truth of things, right? Right, okay, right. We, the scientific method strips subjectivity out. Right. And so his point was like, but we live our lives in this subjective space. Almost everything we care about is very subjective. So maybe right. we should start with the idea that our subjective human experiences are real. Right. Interesting. And when I found that idea, I was like, wait a minute. So that means as someone who doesn't necessarily believe in God as a being, right? I can still talk to someone who does believe that. And when they tell me about their prayer life, for instance, 
I can go like, yes, your experience is real. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I can go that route instead of being like, yeah, you're living in a delusion. <laughs> and it okay, just, it, sure. <laughs> it, it opens up the possibility for thinking of things differently in a really interesting way. Yeah. Uh, so I'm exploring spirituality with a lot of those things in mind. Yeah. Well, I think we have to, I mean, if there's one thing I am, I have learned and, and am continuing to learn, these issues have been debated for forever. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Like they're, they're, they've been in constant, this is the human conversation. And I think what has happened is that we've experienced a very fundamentalist expression of this conversation that says we have these answers, no reason to explore further. It's black and white in this perfect book yep. that essentially was beamed down from heaven above. And now that a lot of us, including you and me, have deconstructed that, it leaves us open to now discerning the full breadth of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't feel nearly as like, oh, am I allowed to, to, to explore this side or this side of a non-Christian thing that might be spiritual? Because it's like, yep. well, this is just part of the human way of, of doing things since the beginning. Yeah. Um, oh, and dude, it's so fun, right? Because like, it is. so it is. I've, I've spent a bunch of st time studying Buddhism mm -hmm. and Buddhism has changed my life. Hmm. I meditate every morning. I Do know that you? sounds, yeah, I know no, that sounds woo woo, it. No, but it, I understand. it is amazing. And, and, and actually it sounds woo woo. And some, some of the practices can be a little woo woo, but the, do you know what I mean when I say woo woo? <laughs> Yes, my wife uses that phrase all the time because my wife is pretty much a Christian mystic witch at this sure. point. Sure, so, great. So I I'm, love it. I'm like, you're woo-woo. <laughs> I would love to hear more about that. Um, but the, the, the benefits of meditation are actually really um, scientifically vetted and they're, yes. they're sig significant. So yes. I meditate every day. My, my meditative practices are influenced by Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, and Taoism, uh, Taoism is like kind of amazing actually. Um, so obviously all Eastern practices, but literally 95% of the way that I engage with those practices would be compatible with Christianity, right? Like yep. completely, yep. like, like not, uh, offensive or, or yep. contradictory at all. Yeah. Um, so, so that's interesting to me. And then, um, can I pause you right there before we yeah. move on? So I've, uh, the meditation thing is, I think it's powerful when I long story short, had a big intense anxiety, panic attack thing for a while. Oh, I'm and sorry. It's fine. It's, it's, it's a gift now, but it wasn't at the time. Right. Mm. And, um, I got into the headspace app for meditation, which yes, for me it's was really like, good. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll never do this, you know, but I got into a real habit for quite some time. It was 10 minutes. And, and honestly, it really was part of my healing. Like I really found the idea of, of stopping and just focusing on your breath and clearing the mind is helpful. And ironically, and this, I would love your commentary on what, what, what I'm going to say. I do find it so fascinating that Christians will do things like that, but not call it that. But yep. once someone calls it that now it's evil, you know, like, yep. Oh, if, if, if you prayed for 15 minutes straight and you were just so focused on the spirit and you just felt a relief, that's great. But if you yep. meditated, Whoa, 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 meditation, yep. it's the same principle. I would say, go to a Bible app and search the word meditation mm, mm -hmm. because it's, it's in the Bible quite a few times yep. actually. Um, and th there's a lot of, yeah. So I, I actually, I interviewed, uh, uh, someone this morning named Dr. Joel Baden, okay. who is the professor of Hebrew Bible at Yale. Shoot. Um, smart guy. Uh, I don't know. Way. I don't know why he agreed to talk to me. Um, but, uh, we talked a lot about the way that we approach scripture. Yes. And, and so he's approaching the Hebrew Bible, which is the Christian old Testament, mm -hmm. you know, um, or I should say the Christian old Testament, which is the Hebrew Bible there you more, go. more accurately. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, the way that Christians approach it, very often is quite rigid and trying to extract a single coherent narrative yep. and smooth over any differences, right? Yeah. Systematizing it. Yeah. The Jewish perspective, it doesn't like most people that are engaging with the text from a Jewish point of view are not engaging it that way. Mm -hmm. So they, 
they view the text as a starting point for connection with other people in the faith. So they go like, what do you think this means? I think it means this. Let's talk about it. Let's hash it out. You know, I think this, you think that. And it's not about synthesizing it and, and, and smoothing over the differences. Totally. It's about the differences and, and the, the contradictions and the, yes. the humanity of the text yeah. being, being a starting point for like connection, human connection and awe and wonder. And like, Oh, wow. Like I never thought about it that way. How cool. Like there's yes. dimensions to this. It's a three-dimensional thing. Right. And it's alive. It changes with culture. Yeah. Our interpretations uh, change with culture. Yeah. So I think that same way about, um, about other religions. So I go, mm. um, like, you know, the Jewish way of looking at how Christians engage with their old Testament, uh -huh. most Jews are like, Hey, you do your thing. Let us do ours. It's right. cool. Like, right. I'm a little annoyed sometimes <laughs> when right. you like interpret things in a way that makes it seem like you're the center here, even right. though this is right. like our Bible, Right. but like, but largely like you do you boo, right? right. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's the, the, the sort of, that's very often the approach that Judaism will take towards Christianity and, and, you know, the Christian old Testament. Totally. I take that approach or I, I, I think more people engaging in spiritual practices should take that approach to religion in general. So Jews aren't trying to make Christians Jewish. Mm. But Christians are trying to make everyone Christian. <laughs> Western American Christian specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know I, mean? yeah. I should be more specific. No, but, no, I'm just but, saying like I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. So so um yeah, I, I right. think there's a tremendous benefit to being open to other faith traditions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, being open to other faith traditions doesn't mean you have to lose your own. Um right. right. And and I would just say like, it's healthy to approach other people's spiritual practices with curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, ha I have a friend, Joe Lumen, who says, Oh yeah, I know Joe. I've interviewed her. Oh yeah. She's yeah. Great. So she's great. Uh, sometimes like she, sometimes she scares me, yes. but, but, <laughs> I told but her other, that too. <laughs> yeah. But other times she absolutely inspires me and, yes. and, and I love having her in my life for, yeah. for both of those. Yes. Yes. Um, but, uh, but one of the things she says is that you can approach other people with curiosity or you can approach them with supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard hitting yeah. phrase, but this is one of those situations where like she said that, and I was like, Oh, I'm going to need to absorb that and think mm -hmm. about that for a while. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is like, she's right. Like, when you approach other traditions or other people as if you have nothing to learn, right, then you're approaching with a with a spirit of superiority. Yeah. You're but right. if you approach with curiosity, you're assuming that you might be able to learn something. Yeah. And if everybody did that, yeah, like what would the world be like? Right. 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 Um, and that's why, like. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for, for her sort of just saying that to me. And even in that way, you know, I'm just like, yep, yeah. yep. I'm glad yeah. I have that. Yeah. Joe is someone when, um, if she comments on my stuff, I'm like, uh Oh, I'm in trouble and I better talk to her. Directly. <laughs> <laughs> and we well, have, she's, yeah, she's ahead. awesome. There's been a, a couple of times where I've posted something and she's like very gently texted yes. me privately. Yes. And said, Hey, just to let you know, this is how that could be received by such and such a group. And, yes. and, and every time I'm just like, Oh, right. I hadn't seen it that way. You're entirely yeah. right. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's curiosity, uh, you know, is something I value a lot and, you know, I'm right now I'm in a, my office is a 1969 Airstream trailer that I, that I work out of. And uh, I've named it the curiosity. So I have sort of a logo on the side that says uh, a tiny logo, not a big, like <laughs> disgusting wrap. Just so um, yeah, but like I have a tiny little logo on the outside that That's says awesome. the curi the curiosity, because I think when we use curiosity as a guiding principle, yes, um, it changes the way that we approach other individuals, other societies, other traditions yep. in a way that, um, 
in a way that can make us, uh, that can allow us to grow and allow other people's space to be who they are. Yes. And when you think about it, it's bizarre that, I mean, in your life, as, as a physical human, you grow. As yeah. a musician, you know, you need to keep growing. You can't stay stagnant, right? As a filmmaker, you progress. So why in, our, in the Christian faith have we been taught that we don't have to? Like, oh, you just, you have it. Like, just stay here. It's not healthy. You know, most yeah. of us are like five-year-olds in the faith. And well, I, I should say we, we see the faith and that makes us stunted, like, stunted, you know, like in our mental growth. And so when we hear about other faiths, like you said, we were just like, oh, I, I can't learn about them. I have to bring my, my supremacy. Oh no, mm -hmm. here's the truth. Here's the truth that you never heard of before. And what that does is it really perpetuates that superiority complex that I think for me, especially, you know, I'm, I'm talking for me now, you know, in 2016, that whole, the whole election, the whole Trump thing. Yeah. That was a moment for me with my faith. I was like, okay, am I even part of this faith anymore? Like what has happened to the faith that I've been taught? you know, that has totally just had this, like, we have the truth. And now, you know, of course, with the election fraud narrative pushed by Christians, it makes you look, you, you, look at it, you look at it and you go, what the hell? Like what happened to these quote unquote truth seekers? I know. It's wild. Know. It's wild. I, yeah, I have thoughts on this <laughs> and I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to get us cause we could do a whole podcast just on this question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I have before. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, here's what I think. I, right. I think that the evangelical movement uh -huh. is it. It sees itself as Christianity, as the purest form of Christianity. Yep. yep. And uh, it is not correct in that. Yes. It's it's right. it's it's a new thing. Yes. In 1950. 60% of Americans were members of mainline Christian churches. That is right. And, and today that number is almost down to 10%. Yeah. So where did those people go? Yep. Well, some of them left the church entirely, but a lot of them went to evangelical churches. Yes. So that shows you there was a huge migration, which shows you massive migrations happen, right? And we've yep. seen them happen over periods of time also but like that was a particularly fast one yeah um so uh, i think why did it happen right i, I think it's because th my parents generation they felt like the way that their parents were engaging with christianity and spirituality was stiff it was rigid. It was uh, not connected with emotions. There were things happening in culture, um, the civil rights movement, and um, there was there was like the um, you know uh, uh, the feminist movement. Yeah. There was um, there was like all these things changing in culture. Yep. And pe young Christians or young people who were becoming Christian wanted an expression of Christianity that was more in line with like their real lives. Yeah. And so evangelicalism was born uh, partially out of that. There was, there's yes. other layers right. for sure. But that was a big but, ingredient. But it's like, it's like, so for them engaging in the evangelical movement was, was a sense of freedom. It was like, Oh my gosh, we don't have to live this really rigid liturgical thing. Right. Um, right. And, and then, like the key there is that there was a group of people, a large group of people who felt like the expression of faith they had been given was no longer working for them. Totally. That same thing is happening now. Yep. Yep. So there's a lot of people that grew up in the evangelical movement that found, especially once they got into their thirties, they're having kids, families, <laughs> careers, they're engaging with the world. They're engaging on issues that they've had time to think about now. Yeah. Right. And, and they're going like this evangelical narrative, this is not working for me. Right. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to have to look my gay friends in the face and say, they're going to hell. Yep. Sometimes it's, I, I don't want to tell anyone they're going to hell because that's sort of awful. Right. Like, like, um, so, I mean, there's like a lot of things like that. And like the Trump thing is a big deal. It's like, we watch, 
we watch the evangelical movement throw its weight behind Trump, not just like yep. begrudgingly, no, but no, enthusiastically. No. Totally. And we go like, wait, this is your guy? Totally. Are you serious? I thought like, it was a joke. <laughs> a joke. Right. Um, and and so like so many of us are like, wait, okay, so if this is what it is to be a Christian, exactly. I am out. Yep. You see kids in cages and you're like, nope. Right. You know, you see right. you see Trump, you know, like being blatantly anti-women, anti-immigrant. Right. And you're like, nope. I right. don't want any part of that. Right. But 81% of ev of white evangelicals voted for Trump in 2020. Yes, they did. And then there was the whole, like you said, the whole, we stole the election narrative that not all evangelicals, but enough evangelicals just bought. Uh, a lot of the big, the big heavy hitters definitely perpetuated. I mean, yeah. the leaders throwing right behind it. So anyway, I'm, I, I try to avoid politics, but here we are. Um, <laughs> I don't. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I'm not saying that to like any of anybody who's listening, who uh, is, it happens to be more politically conservative. This is, I'm not saying any of this to attack you. I, I, I'm saying there are a number of people, a large number of people who saw, who grew up in the church and saw this stuff unfold. And at the very least, it made them uncomfortable uh, and, yeah. and made them go like, I don't know. Now, this is an important point. I don't think that that alone caused people to leave the church en masse, right? Now, I think a lot of evangelicals are like, oh, people are leaving for cultural reasons. Like, they just need to study the word, uh, or like they need to, uh, they need to read, uh, you know, they need to read some books by apologists or right. something yeah, like that. Totally. It's like, like, that's not true. Um, I mean, I mean, it might be in some cases, but most cases what's happening is there's cultural things going on that are giving people pause. And then in that pause, they're reading yep. and researching and learning. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that evangelical Christianity has chosen not to address over the years. Yep. And we find those things. Yep. Now, I'll be the first to admit that a lot of the things that, that are findable, they don't necessarily mean that Christianity is false. Mm -hmm. But there's enough of these threads that you can find if you look that evangelical Christianity has not wanted to talk about yep. because they're uncomfortable conversations. That when you find these, it's hard not to look to step back and be like, I've been lied to. Exactly. Exactly. And many people, when they reach that point, they go like, I'm out. And they right. never come back. Especially when the posture from those people is, oh, well, you're just backsliding. Oh, you don't know the truth. It's like, the oh, yeah. And then you have enough humility. It's and then you have evangelicals like mischaracterizing the reasons that you left. And it's like, well, thanks for confirming that I made the right decision. Exactly. You know, it's like, exactly. please. Exactly. Like, do you know how do you know how good the LGBTQ plus community has been to me the last year? Do you know how good the atheist community has been to me? And not in a like good for you for like giving up your like your BS beliefs. It's like it's like so many people who are outspoken atheists have come alongside me and been like, hey, are you doing OK? This is yeah. hard. Yeah. And I'm like, if you categorize people as like, if you're not Christian, you're unethical and uncaring. Right. And then if, if that's your narrative. Right. And then people leave Christianity and they find ethical and caring people outside of Christianity. Yep. They just like, it's like, they're going to, you've lost all your credibility. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're completely 1 million percent. I mean, I, I, like, like you said, we could spend a whole, we can spend two more hours unpacking all. Oh, I know. And I'm sorry. So I'm true. ranting at this oh, point. Oh, please don't but... be sorry. That's why I have you on my show. I, you know, people, <laughs> my, so people, my audience, my account, is just to kind of give you like a perspective is please do it's mostly it, it's definitely a range i have i have some conservative evangelicals on my space i have some atheists in my space but most people are these people who are like okay this evangelical thing like i think i'm i'm like i'm either in it and i'm really wrestling with it or i'm over it 
but yeah. I'm also like still committed to like this Jesus thing, but I don't, I don't know what that looks like yet. Yeah. I need, yeah, I need yeah. a safe place I can talk about it. And that's yeah. like, that's the space my account is like filling. Right. And so one of the big, I, I call them ingredients. Like, you know, you put certain ingredients and you, you get a deconstructing Christian. And one of them is by for sure. Uh, it's the two things that you mentioned. It is the, the, not just holding the nose of Trump, but the full on endorsement from yeah. not only not only evangelical leaders, but of course the 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 um you know laity. And I I always tell people like I tell pastors all the time. I say you don't get it. You think that you're discipling your congregation, but the reality is that Sean Hannity, Charlie Kirk, right wing media, that's discipling your congregation. Trust me, I you know, hundred like, percent agree. They're the ones who are soaking that in. Um, and the other thing, like you said, is when you find out that, oh, the Protestant tradition in America has been on the predominantly on the wrong side of racism and slavery, and we still haven't made amends. And people yeah, defend and, it. Yeah, and over the last year with the Black Lives Matter movement, oh. seeing seeing the evangelical response to that stuff, um, that that's terrible. been very disheartening for many people. Very. Um, very. It, myself included. It's been like, oh, okay, like, I'm glad those people don't speak for me anymore. Right. And, and honestly, yeah. John, like I'm very much like you. We're not here to dehumanize people, right? I'm not here to tell you. No, no. That, and hey, they're bad people. My, my parents are conservative. My, my dad, they love Trump. They're good people, right? I say my that parents because, too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I say that because what I tell people is it's not that I think you're a bad person. I just don't think that you're really being consistent with the Jesus ethic that you claim. There's, it's not consistent. Like what your political ideology yeah. and outworking and how you handle this and the Black Lives Matter stuff is yeah. not consistent with the consistent Jesus ethic. So something is at odds here, you know, and uh, I like you get very fired up over this. I get very passionate. Oh, I, I, this I, bonkers. I so I so get this. OK, I want to read you. This is something I don't do on a lot of shows. I want to read you a Bible verse. All right, I'll buckle it up. <laughs> buckle up. I haven't done this in a long time. So Matthew 25, I think about Matthew 25 a lot. Yes. So, so in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about basically who will participate in the kingdom of heaven. Right. Now I could get into details here, but like in Matthew, Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven and Luke tends to use the term kingdom of God. There's good reasons for that, but we'll leave that aside. Okay. Um, But Matthew 25, toward the end of the chapter, Jesus talks about, Basically, who who will be, uh, you know, I'm just going to read, I'm just going to read this. So when the son of man comes in, this is starting verse 31. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another uh, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite or do you see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you when did we see you sick in or in prison and go to visit you the king will reply truly i tell you whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me so i read that yep. and he tells the flip side too of the people who didn't do those things right and literally jesus is saying this is how you enter the kingdom of heaven There's no salvation by grace here, Yep. right? This is, this is how you should live, right? Yep. Give a shit about the people that you have no reason to give a shit about. Mm -hmm. I read this and so many people like me read this and they go like, I'm into that Jesus, right? I'm into that. Yeah. And then they see the conservative narrative and the sort of evangelical narrative, which is like, I don't want to pay for these. uh, I don't want to, well, these illegal immigrants, I'm, I don't want to pay for their healthcare. Uh, They they shouldn't be coming here. Um, Like all of these, it's like, 
oh, well, we shouldn't, oh, we don't want to have a welfare state. People are just living <laughs> off the government, you know? It's wild. Like, uh, oh, no, we don't want to have universal health care. Um, and like, gosh, this is the most political I think I've ever gotten on a podcast. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if I'm going to regret it, but here we are. Um, I just, I read this. And then I see the evangelical narrative and I recognize for people that are listening, this is not every person who identifies an evangelical. I'm just saying the sort of overarching narrative yeah. that people like me have been seeing. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not coming for individuals here. It's like an overarching sort of a perception of the movement, right? Yeah, that's fair. We perceive the movement, the evangelical movement as being against the very people that Jesus says we're supposed to be for. And enough of us see that and be like, okay, well, I'm out. Right. Because you're not about the Jesus I'm reading about in Matthew. Yeah. You're on the money, dude. I mean, Pastor John over here, I'm saying. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can't believe I just read scripture on a podcast. Um, anyway, like, yeah. All that to say, like, obviously, sure. I still find myself really inspired by the character of Jesus. Yeah. I don't know if he said any of these things. Right. I don't I don't know. Um, I, I, I find it really uh, powerful to read them. Yeah. And so I go I go like, how can I. How can I walk? And this is a Buddhist idea. Hmm. Um, there's this Buddhist idea of ahimsa, which is non harm, hmm. which I think is one of the most beautiful ideas I've ever encountered. And, and it's basically this idea that you should go through life using harm as a guide. So like, how can I go through my life inflicting as little harm on myself, the people around me, the, the wildlife around me, it, it, indeed the earth too. It's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a sort of climate and earth, you know, environmental focus to this. Definitely. It's almost like if I'm going to walk through a field, how few blades of grass can I bend over? Mm -hmm. Right. That's, I like thinking about it that way. Yeah. It's nice. Not, not because it's bad to bl bend a blade of grass, but because like, isn't it a beautiful way to go through life with a light footprint? Yeah. And and making things better instead of worse everywhere you go for people who struggle with things that that maybe we don't struggle with or 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 maybe even better maybe things we do struggle with and we can have empathy for yeah, yeah. um so i see i see jesus in matthew 25 and i go like i'm into that guy yeah yeah. But the evangelical movement and Christianity as I've experienced, yeah. I have a hard time with. It's a it's a very fair critique that I only hope people who make those decisions that we don't make are listening, frankly. I'm not sure if they are. I follow quite a few different accounts of pastors and leaders in that space and man, some of the stuff that 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 they share or who they have speak at their church. I mean, I saw a church that literally had Charlie Kirk come and speak on their Sunday morning service. I'm just like, how, 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 how? And it gets me, it gets me discouraged, but also riled up, but also hopeful because I know that there are people like me and like you who, even if we don't agree on the theology of things right now, because we're, because we're still kind of in process together, even if we're in different spaces, you know, or I, I should say different paths on that journey. Sure. Um, we're like, yes, can we do less harm? Can we love our neighbor better? Like those are just like universal human things you know can we can we help people you know be the best versions yeah. of themselves that's a beautiful yeah. goal to strive for and christianity does not own that idea yeah you know so yeah. what whatever lies at the root of our existence whatever yeah. that is mm -hmm. you know um i mentioned earlier that i don't believe in god well you, we talked about in my post a year ago in yeah. may of 2020 i posted that i the, my wording was, I fi I'm finding that I no longer believe in God. Yes. And, and I would modify that now to say that I don't believe in God in the way that I did. Yeah. I still wouldn't probably say the sentence, I believe in God, because I feel like what that conjures up is not accurate. <laughs> like, yes. it's not accurate. Yeah. But I do, like, 
we exist. Yes. We're here. Right. That is remarkable and, um, and beautiful. And we can marvel at it. Um, one of the principal ideas in Taoism is that the first line in Tao Te Ching is the Tao that can be told is not the eternal and unchanging Tao. Hmm. And the Tao just means the way. So it's like the idea there is that when you're trying to grasp what God is or the divine is or whatever that thing is that you're trying to get at, like the minute you name it, it slips through your fingers. Hmm. The minute, like the minute you think you've got it is exactly the moment you've lost it. Hmm. And when you hold it loosely and with mystery and with wonder, and you kind of go like, I don't know, but it's like, there's something about this life and this existence that has the ability to, we have the ability to encounter meaning. Mm. Yes. And, and, and that's interesting. Yeah. And, and wherever that comes from, you know, is God an idea? Is it like a, is it, is God like a force, like, like in star Wars, you know, <laughs> right. like, is, is it an energy? Right. Is it, is it quantum mechanics? I don't know. Right. Right. I think there's something going on, but, yeah. but, but in my, the more a faith tradition concretizes that idea, yeah. the, the more idolatrous it seems to me. Hmm. And that's why, that's why I love the Eastern traditions because the Eastern traditions embrace the not knowing very often. Right. Buddhism and Taoism specifically Taoism for sure. It's like, you can't know, like, <laughs> like there's this thing that's really amazing. I can't tell you about it. I can just sort of beat around the bush in hopes that you get the idea. <laughs> mm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, I don't remember where this, there was maybe no question at the beginning of this. That's so I'm like. just rambling at this point, but I think the progressive Christian movement is approaching Christianity with that same um, yeah. spirit yeah, and going like, I don't know. Right. But like, but there's something about, you know, there's something about the teachings of Jesus that are interesting. There's something about this faith tradition that's doing something for me. Right. It's just, there's this, all this other stuff that I just like, yeah. that I experientially don't like and intellectually don't feel is mandatory. Yeah, that's good. Well, listen, on that note, just for sake of time, um, yeah. we, we can end it there. I do <laughs> want to get you back at some point because you, you know what? You were right. We are over an hour, so you did it. Sorry, I've told no, you it's impossible for me. That's okay because I yeah. honestly, like, you know, you have great perspective and I wish I had more time because I have a, I have a drum student coming soon, but cool. you know, it's like, I would love to hit like all these things even deeper sometimes. So maybe I'll have <laughs> you back and we can try round sure. number two with John. But sure. where, can people, where can people find you? Are you on, I know you're on Instagram, are you on YouTube? You know, podcast, yeah, so, plug everything. Yeah, my show is called The Wonder and the Mystery of Being. And it's on all the podcasty places. So if it's <laughs> nice. like Apple Podcasts, you know, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all that. And then it's also on YouTube. Um, I think the best experience is on YouTube, but also, you know, watching... My episodes are usually about an hour and a half. So it's like okay. a, and, and it's, they come out every Friday. Okay. So uh, it's a big commitment, I realize. So, you know, engage with it however you like. But yes, I'm also in, on Instagram, John Steingard, just J O N uh, Steingard. Just g take a guess. I'll put it in the show notes. So you yeah. Can click on it right there, so. <laughs> uh, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter. Those are probably the two places I engage uh, sort of the most. So awesome, John. Well, thanks yeah. for making time and thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Tim. Absolutely.